University can be a stressful time. Sometimes we'll be going from right at the top of our school year to really struggling to find our feet academically at university. In this video, we're going to go over some tips to help us better adapt to this transition. Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. My name is Rohan, I'm a third year medical student studying at Cambridge University. And in this video, I thought we'd talk about 10 academic tips which I've come across to help better adapt to the transition between the final year of school and the first year of university. Hopefully this video will be useful, particularly for prospective medical students. Before we get into the tips, I just want to give a disclaimer like I did with the one on my social and non-academic tips for first year university students. And that is, there's no right way to do university. I know so many people who study in different ways to what I do, have completely different habits and they still perform really well. These are just the tips which I found helpful, which resonated with me. To compile this list, I also asked some of my medical friends if they had any suggestions, and yes, yeah, some of them are included in this list as well. So let's get started with tip number one, and this is a common FAQ which I hear, and it's whether, like, what do I need to do over the summer to prepare for first year of medical school or, or first year of any course. For me, I'd say avoid just revising your A-level content to get because it's just not a very productive way to spend your time. I mean, during first year and during your course, if there are any relevant bits from your A-level studies, when they crop up, then you can go look back at your notes, but it's just so inefficient to revise everything again, even though only like a few bits and bobs here and there will come up. I'm not saying don't do anything academically during your summer holidays before starting uni. You could like read around the subject again, you could write articles and things, but just going over your A-levels again, for me, or, and at least for medicine, is not that useful. Tip number two, and that is to follow your university timetable as closely as possible. There is a culture to skip lectures in university. For me, where possible, I would say just go to every lecture, even like the really low yield and boring ones, because as I said in my previous video, it's a good way just to socialise and meet new people on your course. I think the problem, particularly with online lectures in this past year, is it can kind of give a full sense of security. Basically like, you have loads of unfinished lectures kind of starting to pile up, but then you're always like, oh, I can see it at any time. But then that time just never comes. Do your best, even if it's a 9 a.m., just to get up and just do the lecture in that slot. Even if you don't like going to the lecture, I guess, open the lecture notes and read them through during that time, just so you don't fall behind. It's also good to do this because, like, the effect of study techniques like active recall and space repetition, these work a lot better over a longer period of time, where you can really encode things into your long-term memory. So yeah, following the timetable will basically help you avoid cramming situations. The third tip which I had is don't stress if you do fall behind. Particularly for really busy courses like medicine, there is a lot of content being thrown at you. I don't know many people who keep on top of things throughout the whole term. Eventually, like assignments and deadlines will start taking up so much of your time that you won't have time to like learn every single fact in the lecture notes. You know, that's absolutely fine and the holidays are quite long and where well, you can just consolidate on the material, catch up of any like understanding which you didn't get time to do during term. I guess this kind of feeds into a wider point about imposter syndrome because often when we're behind, we kind of just blame ourselves and we just think we're the only one who's struggling. And the reality is if you just speak to some other people, they're also struggling and they're also like way behind or they're just like faking it and they're actually just lying to you. Just remember that you're awesome. Don't bother comparing like marks on different assignments to your peers because at the end of the day, a mark on a stupid test or uh, exam, that doesn't define you as a person. I think we're on tip number four and this is to ask your lecturers or supervisors or tutors or whoever for help. This is one of my, one of the things which I think I'm getting a lot better at these days and that's by yeah, not being afraid even to ask really stupid questions or just trying to either like stop them there or ask them to repeat something or if it's a lecture going to them at the end if I didn't understand it. In general most people will be so happy that you asked the question because they'll have the same question and it's really good just to clarify something then and there rather than going away and trying to figure out for an hour for yourself what it is because often these people who are teaching you, they would have done the research to actually find out that fact. So they can tell you a really good explanation in a couple of minutes and just save like an hour of your life. So yeah, make sure that you just ask any of your doubts straight away to your teachers. Number five is to work together. Yeah, I think this is really important in university where you might have more content to take on in that school because 
It really isn't a competition, like, school can sometimes feel like a bit of a toxic, competitive environment. I, I know for me, I always felt that I had a big target on my back, and I literally remember people used to try wind me up by saying, oh, I got the same as you on a test or something, but like, a unit's completely different, especially in medicine, like, we're all gonna be doctors at the end of it, and no one really cares, like, if you got like 2% higher than someone else, like, in general, it's just a lot better that you help each other, and then everyone gets better as, as a result, so one really practical way you can do this, and this is something I did with some of my friends, is to share essay plans, because they are so time consuming, but if you can trust someone who has like a similar level of work to you, and you know who is reliable and will produce really good quality plans, it's just such a good way to like literally half your workload. Don't like withhold resources and notes when people ask you, like, yeah, just give openly because, well, if you're Christian, I guess it's biblically mandated, uh, as we talked about previously. Tip number six, and this is to pre-read your lectures. So most universities and most lecturers, they'll release their lecture notes or lecture slides before the lecture actually takes place. So reading through it, even if it's just for like 10-15 minutes, can be really helpful because the lecture itself is a very fast pace. It's, it's different to how you learn at school. Like, they're just like bombarding you with like facts and information and you're expected to process it. So if you have a head start in that process by like, even if you just Googled some terms you weren't familiar with, that can really help you get the most out of the lecture. The way I approach this, especially when we had in-person lectures is, I would put a star beside any concepts which I couldn't really understand, and that would be like a cue for me during the lecture to really make sure I concentrate in this bit. I like to think of it like I did the easy bit by just like rote learning some basic facts or just trying to get to grips with some concepts, but all the higher level stuff, I'd let the lecturer explain to me. So by the end of the lecture, hopefully I have a fairly good understanding of what's going on. So even though I haven't like memorized all the details, it will be a lot easier for me to do that going forward instead of like not having pre-read the lecture, having no clue what was going on, losing concentration halfway through, and then basically having to teach it all to myself later on. If it is a pre-recorded lecture, I don't tend to pre-read, I tend to like watch five minutes of lecture, pause it, then read the notes, and make sure I understand before continuing. Yeah, that kind of takes a lot of time, but at least you understand it really well by the end. Point number seven, and this is probably one of the most important ones, is to learn how to learn. As we touched on before, lectures are completely different to school lessons. It's really important that we don't just stick exactly to the same methods that we do at school, because many times they're just, they won't work. I mean, sometimes they will, and you can just continue, but many times the demands of your course will require a different style of learning. So we shouldn't be afraid to just experiment with like, maybe like new note-taking systems. I thought it might be helpful just to give my opinions or like how I learnt for the three big subjects we had in first year, so I'm sorry this is, this might not be the same for every medical school, but in Cambridge our main three subjects for first year were anatomy, physiology and biochemistry. Because it's Cambridge they give like really stupid names for them, but I'll skip over that. Basically for anatomy, I remember we used to have these exams called steeplechases. Basically, you just had to identify uh, what the flagged item was on a specimen, and then also answer a question on it. At the start, I made a mistake of just trying to learn all what everything was called, and like, learn all the theory, but I completely neglected learning the spatial aspects and how the structures relate to each other. So basically, I just didn't look at enough diagrams, and that was really stupid, because anatomy is, at its heart, a visual subject, like, it's describing what the structures look like and how they relate to one another. So yeah, that was really stupid of me, and it took me a while to learn how to learn anatomy. The method at which I kind of ended up using, and this really helped, is basically, at the start, I'd look at really, like, stylized and basic diagrams. So things like on Teach Me Anatomy, they have some really nice, simple line diagrams to follow. And I also used, like, a 3D atlas, so this was called Visible Body. In that you could maybe like just show the arteries, just show the veins, just show the nerves. So basically you just see everything in its ideal form. And I'd really make sure I understood like what was behind what, what was medial, what was lateral, all that type of jazz. I made sure I realised what it should look like before then trying to learn what all like the origins, insertions and all like the nitty gritty details. And then after that, I'd come back to learning structures, but this time I'd look at like real life structures, so human anatomy atlases, like I think Rohan's anatomy atlas, there's also like McMinn's anatomy atlas. These are more complex because everything looks a lot similar in real life, like veins aren't like bright blue, they're kind of a much more dull blue in real life. I think this system really helped me, and of course to like learn a nitty gritty I use techniques such as 
Anki flashcards and mnemonics, I think that's pretty common for everyone. Having this like three step way of learning anatomy really did help me boost my marks in anatomy. For physiology, for first term, I was a bit stupid. For some reason I just underestimated it and just thought it was a bit easy. And I remember in my first term essays I just got absolutely roasted by my supervisor because I just was not precise enough. And I think for physiology it's really important to keep asking the question why be really precise with each stage of a process. It's really helpful just to like draw out the flow diagrams and be really precise like what actually causes blood pressure. It's the mean systemic filling pressure. It's like that last 20% of the volume which is causing stretch on the blood vessels. It's that level of detail you want to get to in physiology to actually understand it. I think sometimes because it's kind of similar to some of the things you've learned at A-level biology, it's sometimes easy to fall back into bad habits and just explain things in A-level terms rather than just taking it up that little bit further to really give detailed answers. So that was the main thing for physiology. For biochemistry, it's difficult to say exactly. I mean, there's just a lot of detail in general. But for biochemistry, it's also helpful to try come up with general rules where you can. So for example, like, <laughs> I forgot all about biochemistry, but like anabolic metabolism that uses ATP and you're making bigger carbon structures and catabolic is opposite. Uh, you're producing ATP, but you're making substrates shorter and like what reactions are more likely to happen when. You could do like a similar thing for like oncogenes and tumor suppressors, I can imagine. For biochemistry in particular, I also found it helpful to actually understand what was going on in the practicals, like what actually happens in gel electrophoresis, what's the difference between SDS page, like denaturing and non-denaturing electrophoresis, and when you'd use each type. I don't know why I just went for electrophoresis, but we're just gonna roll with it. Yeah, actually understanding the processes and why you do them really helped me, well, at least attempt better the practical questions. Like the practical component is probably the hardest part of the biochemistry. Okay, tip number eight, and this is particularly important for, I think, courses which have a lot of content, is the 80-20 rule. I think it's I think it might also be called a Pareto principle. Basically like 20% of the content will get you 80% of the marks. So you wanna like prioritize understanding the big picture of what's going on because that's more likely to have like high yield marks. Looking at past papers might help you determine these facts better. And then this just feeds into a larger point about learning with an exam focus versus learning for fun. And you should really be intentional on which one you're going for. So yeah, I I'm not saying which way or approach is right or wrong. Like. I very much tend to lean on just playing the game and trying to optimize my exam marks, but occasionally I will like indulge in like researching some random thing or maybe go to a biology society talk just to kind of broaden the horizons or whatever. Tip number nine is that there's a lot of free time at university and it's a lot more unstructured than at school. Even like in busy courses like in medicine, some days we only had like maybe like two lectures in a day, so that's two hours of contact time. So. I think it's really important to treat your degree professionally. So have a like a normal work day, let's say like nine to five or something. I think just in general, being more intentional with your time will help you get the most out of your experience. Because as we talked about in the previous video, you want to be optimizing for like high density fun rather than just sitting on your bed and scrolling for your phone. One way in which you could achieve this is by trying to do a little bit of work every day because this is another big thing about university is like there's not much really to track your progress with. It's really your responsibility over your learning. I know that sounds like quite cliche, but at university like there are, there are none of these like mini tests. So you don't really know how you're doing until like a big mock exam comes up and then you get like this rude shock and you're like, whoa, this is, this is harder than expected. I guess the main message is like try work consistently and don't leave it all to the end. I really like the way Ali Abdal puts this. He says having work as a default option. I think it allows you to be more spontaneous actually and that sounds a bit counterintuitive but if you're working at a baseline rate and then someone says oh do you want to hang out or do you want to go out for a meal you more than likely have probably done all your assignments already because you've been diligent and just working away when nothing else is in your calendar it gives you the license to accept more things this is something which i applied with church so i like to try and make sundays as relaxed as possible so when most people were kind of like chilling on saturday and hanging out with their friends i used to try work as hard as I could on Saturday and finish all the essays I had to do for the week. So by Sunday, the objective was to not have to write any essays and I'd usually do like chill work or like start on some revision like very slowly. It also gave me the opportunity to go to church and share a meal with them. Even if there was like an ultimate frisbee match, I'd go to that or do a long run. So I, I had more time for myself and to spend with other people, which was really fun. I think this is point number 10 and this is don't buy textbooks. Yeah, I, th I think this is now conventional wisdom, but 
definitely in previous generations, particularly for subjects like medicine, is very much like, oh, you must buy these textbooks and you must learn it from page one to page 1000. These days, for most courses, all the examiner material is in your lecture notes. So there's no point learning this big textbook because that's just such an inefficient way of learning. Textbooks do have a role. They're not completely useless. Textbooks are useful for like extra content. So for example, getting more clinical information to beef up your essays. And if you're really like struggling to understand a topic, sometimes that more detailed explanation which a textbook provides can be really helpful. But there's no need to go buy them, like the library will have enough copies of all the main textbooks for your course. You can even probably find like PDFs online from all the editions of the textbook. I mean, they're still factually accurate. So that's all for this video. I hope you found it useful. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel for more content like this in the future. Anyway, take care and bye for now.